everyone, thank you so much for joining me again. I'm Lilac and I upload several times a week, so please feel free to check out my channel and subscribe. So if you've seen my other videos, you know that I've gone through the Lynx surgery for reflux and I'm now two years out. And what I've done is I've collected questions that you guys have left as comments on my other Lynx related videos from the last two years. This is the list. As you can see, there's a lot to go through. I wanted to sort of divide the video into sections. So if you look down below here, you can click on a certain section or just hover over it and it'll show you the name of the section and the questions will be there. Also, if you look in the description below, there's a timing and the section and what I'll be talking about. So if you wanted to jump at any point to a specific question or skip something, that'll help you see where is the information that you're looking for. Now, before we start going through the questions, uh, I wanna say a few things. First of all, I'm not being paid to make this video or any of the other videos. I just looked for information about the link surgery when I was considering it and couldn't find a lot on the internet. So at the time I made a decision to document my progress from before the surgery uh, all the way to, as you can see now, two years down the line. And just for the sake of authenticity, some of you have been asking me, why is it that in some of the other videos, your accent sounds a bit more UK? For a while there, because I'm a voiceover artist, I was practicing my UK accent. I didn't really know I was gonna get that much following to those videos. So I hope it doesn't come across as too weird and that you know that I am an authentic person. I also wanna take this opportunity to thank everyone for being part of our community, for asking questions. I think the conversation on the comments is also really helpful for people who are considering the surgery. Two years out, I'm really, really happy and this is why I'm doing it, to help other people and give you guys more information. So let's just go ahead and start with the general pre-op questions. What were your GERD and LPR symptoms? So my GERD symptoms were heartburn or acid reflux. I did have sometimes, sorry for the colorful description, sort of like acidic fluid from the digestion come up my esophagus and then it would end up in my mouth where I would swallow it. It felt really bad. It happened um, once or twice at night, but sometimes it just happened during the day, especially after meals. So if I had to sum up my LPR symptoms, it was dry mouth, sticky saliva, super dry skin of the lips. Um, I would get blocked sinuses. I would get trouble breathing. So in the lungs, like respiratory issues. I would get um, voice problems like hoarseness and having to clear my throat, uh, problems with singing, recording, and I think that's about it. Um, I did upload a video with some recommendations about products that have helped me deal with my LPR symptoms back when I had them. So if you are suffering symptoms of LPR at the moment, then feel free to click the banner that just popped up. It is not endorsed in any way. It's just some stuff that I found very useful in dealing with my LPR symptoms. Moving on, how long did you suffer from GERD and LPR symptoms before your surgery? So I think I suffered from about 10 years of GERD, so reflux. The more I was dependent on PPIs or acid blockers, so those are the pills like Omeprodex, Pepto-Bismol and the like, uh, the more I was dependent on those, I think my LPR symptoms became worse. There's no proof of that, but that's kind of like was my observation. So uh, yeah, the LPR, I would say I'd suffer from it for about three years. What dosage of PPIs were you on before the surgery and for how long? So like I said, I've been taking the PPIs for about 10 years, but I started with a very low manageable dosage and then slowly um, it has risen and risen until I was on 40 milligrams twice a day. That's 80 milligrams total per day. Okay, did the PPIs help your LPR? So like I mentioned before, I it definitely hasn't helped much. It may have made it worse. Before the surgery, did you lay flat on your back or on your side or did you have to sleep elevated? If you did, did sleeping elevated help? For the majority of time, I was fine. But about two years before the surgery, um, when symptoms worsened, and then obviously the PPIs were helping the GERD, but they were not resolving my LPR. And then I had the respiratory effects, uh, which then led me to buy an elevating pillow. Did it help? Yes, it definitely helped. So this is the elevating pillow I had. It's very good. I'll put the link in the description to this specific pillow that you can get from Amazon. So these are symptom related questions about GERD. Ever since I've been on PPIs and acid blockers, my tummy is always bloated. Did you experience this? So no, I didn't have bloatiness because of the GERD, but I did suffer some IBS, digestion issues and bloating that was not related to GERD. I had issues with IBS, yes, over the years. I think there is some kind of correlation between 
reflux issues and IBS issues because obviously if something is not 100% in your digestion system over a long time then that could lead to reflux problems. My stomach often feels very full of acid. Have you experienced this? For me personally I didn't feel acid in my stomach. I felt the acid only here what we call heartburn so around the solar plexus area and sometimes little bits of it going up into my throat or even into my mouth. Have you ever had regurgitation of food and liquids before the surgery? Did the surgery make it better? I think I think I may have had once or twice regurgitation of let's say a small piece of food. Was it regular? No, it wasn't happening regularly. Um, but like I said, sometimes liquids, yes, acidic liquids would come into my mouth. I wouldn't say very often. I have a constant burning sensation in my solar plexus. That's the heartburn that we all know. Does this go away after link surgery? Yes, it does. <laughs> Short and sweet. Um, do I suffer from any heartburn right now? No, no heartburn whatsoever. Did you ever have trouble swallowing solids? No, I did not. I'm suffering of bad breath because of GERD. Can Lynx surgery fix that problem? So yes, uh, bad breath can come because of GERD reflux and it can also come because of just silent reflux. I did sense that my bad breath was more because of silent reflux because I've had GERD like I said for more years than I had the silent reflux and I didn't feel like I had bad breath then. So I think it was getting worse as my silent reflux was getting worse. Can link surgery fix that problem? Yes it can. <laughs> my partner says it's so much better. I've seen in other people that it's much better. I think the bad breath is still triggered by usual trigger food. So anything that's acidic, like maybe if I'm going to eat spicy food and then uh, drink wine and then have a coffee and a chocolate, maybe I'll still get a bit of that dryness and maybe some bad breath, but nothing that wouldn't be fixed by brushing my teeth and chewing a gum. I also want to add, because reflux come up at night, it can cause issues with gums and teeth because that acidity is lingering inside the whole of your mouth throughout the sleep. And bad breath is sometimes caused by gum disease. I've met several people who actually didn't know that they had gum disease, but when I commented about bad breath, they went to check it and then they ended up finding out that they do have some kind of inflammation of the gums. Check with your dentist because sometimes it doesn't necessarily hurt but it is still there and that would be causing bad breath and then reflux would also instigate that and make it worse. Moving on to symptom related questions about LPR. Now I'm going to start by saying that LPR or silent reflux is confusing even for the doctors. There seem to be a lot of different symptoms that relate to LPR, but some of them are not distinctively linked with LPR. Some of them may have other underlying conditions that are causing them. But what I can do for you today is I've collected from all you guys' comments all the symptoms that you related to LPR that you've experienced. So if you're wondering, do I have LPR? How do I know if I have LPR? If you've got several of these symptoms, then it might be it. But let's go ahead. Acidic reflux, regurgitation, blocked ears, blocked nose, migraines, eye pain, throat tightness, excessive throat clearing, swallowing difficulty, swallowing pain, choking while eating, throat burning, trouble breathing, chest pain, chest tightening, clogged ears, dry and nasally sinuses, sinusitis, red nose, red throat, dry mouth, sticky saliva, excess mucus, excess phlegm and cough, hoarse voice, vocal cord issues, pain while speaking, sound sensitivity, stomach burn, bad breath, yellowing teeth, hiatal hernia, misdiagnosed allergy, acidity in throat, acidity in the mouth, sickness, nausea, lump in throat sensation, stomach burn, stomach gurgling, acid breath, stinky breath, sore throat, swollen tonsils. That's a lot, isn't it? So I'm hopeful that you don't have all of them. Now, a lot of people came forward and said, I have these and these and these and these symptoms. Do I have LPR? So what I wanted to do is I wanted to refer you to a link on the website called Reflux UK, symptoms and diagnosis. Okay, eligibility symptom checker for both LPR and GERD. It will tell you what you probably have. So uh, I've left the link down below to that check. Feel free to 
click on it and take the test. Was dry mouth something you experienced as an LPR symptom and did that improve after the surgery? Yes, I did. And it has improved significantly. I still might get a little bit of the dry mouth sensation if I combine some triggering foods together. For example, if I would have a coffee with a shot of brandy in it and then some chocolate next to it. All those three foods are very acidic. And then yes, sometimes I would get the dry mouth afterwards. However, I cannot compare it to how it was before the surgery. I can still record vocally. I can still sing and perform. My voice doesn't seem to break. It's still strong. So yes, while doctors may say, okay, the surgery is not meant specifically for LPR and we cannot give you a guarantee that it will work. I can say from my experience, it has definitely helped. Did you have excess mucus and frequent throat clearing? And how much did the Lynx implant help with your phlegm? So yes, I did have more phlegm. I think if the sinuses get blocked and then suddenly they open, then there is some kind of a residue coming down and then it would go into the throat. Um, and I did have more throat clearing. Did it help? Yes, because I don't have it anymore. There you go. Did you suffer from a post nasal drip due to LPR? No, not really. I had more blocked sinuses. I didn't have the post nasal drip, but I know what you guys mean. I could definitely imagine that that is a symptom of LPR. Did you have sinusitis or any sound sensitivity before surgery? And did the surgery help with that? No, I didn't have any of those. So this is a bad breath question about LPR. Did you suffer from bad breath before the surgery? As I said, yes. Was it worse in the morning and before bedtime? Yes, definitely. It's worse after hours of not eating because that's when the acidity seems to be very active. You know, it's probably just an unpleasant breath that comes from the gut. And I think different people would define or describe the smell differently. So it's a little bit difficult to answer what exactly it smelled like. Did you have any chest pain or tightening? No, I didn't have any chest pain or tightening. Did you ever have trouble breathing or a strong burn in your stomach? If so, did the operation get rid of it? So like I said, I had sometimes difficulty to complete breath and I could feel it in the sides of my lungs. I know that because I once had pneumonia and once bronchitis and I know that feeling where you cannot complete your breath. Um, no, I didn't have a strong burn in my stomach. Usually if you have a stomach burn, it says that the acidity in your stomach is too high, as in the pH. Okay, so these are pre-op treatment related questions. So questions about treatments that I may have or may not have had before surgery. Since you have quite a holistic view, what natural alternatives did you try before Lynx? And why did you decide to go ahead with the surgery after all? Okay, so that was a great question. Yes, if you look at my channel, um, I'm all about holistic view, about mindfulness, about natural treatment. And then people come and say, okay, so why didn't all of that help you? Well, the thing is, there is not a single treatment for a single person. There's a whole world of treatments out there. And what you have to do is just find what works for you. And I usually think that a combination of treatments is really the best way forward. Now, just because I have a holistic view doesn't mean I don't use uh, conventional medicine because I think it's all about combining different therapies. I also always try to treat the three human elements when treating any condition, which is the physical, the mental and the emotional. And I think because we exist over those three elements correlatingly, so all the time, okay, you cannot separate the body from the mind, the mind from the emotions. So because we are a combination of systems and we embody all those three elements, if you really want to get to a solution of a chronic problematic situation and you cannot find the solution by doing one thing, then try combining two things and three things and try therapies on different levels to get to the best solution. And that's what I see as holistic, not necessarily to say that surgery wasn't part of my holistic view because I think that's exactly what it was. So the natural therapies that I used were in the physical aspect, I've tried acupuncture, chiropractic treatment, kinesiology, which is muscle testing. Nate, also muscle testing. Nate is Namadrupa allergy elimination treatment. And my elevated pillow, which I showed you before. In the dietary sense, what I've tried, I tried taking bicarbonated soda, eating walnuts, apple cider vinegar, supplementing with betaine HCL, which is adding acidity to the stomach to see whether the reflex is based on low acidity, low pH and not high pH. Didn't help. I went to a nutritionist and took food supplements. I tried the fast tracked diet, plant-based diet, keto diet, alkaline diet, and different types of homeopathy. On the mental front, um, I tried guided imagery and meditation and 
theta healing, which I became a therapist at eventually because theta healing is absolutely amazing. Yeah, so as you can see, I've tried a lot of things over the span of 10 years. I'm not going to say that neither of them helped and that's why I ended in surgery because I don't believe in that. I think the journey to healing is as it is, a journey. A lot of times when a problem persists, we got to look at the different elements in our lives that maybe have contributed over time. If we are dealing with a lot of gut, digestion related issues, it's really worth looking at the mental aspect, stress related issues. For a short period of time, I had bulimia, meaning that my uh, lower esophagus sphincter, okay, the LES, was probably not closing very well because I used to trigger it to puke. Why did I end up doing the surgery? Because I think at some point, one has to want to stop the suffering. Just because there might be another solution out there does not mean that I have to try it. By that time, I've done all the rest of the work where mentally I was prepared to stop suffering. It just didn't suit me anymore. I felt like I was over it. And I felt like that was just the physical thing, probably the hernia as well, it wasn't helping. And I just chose to treat that surgically and be happy again because I deserved it. What other clinical procedures did you consider and why did you choose link surgery? So this is the list of other procedures that I know of to help reflux. Um, Nissen fund application, which is the usual surgery where they wrap a section of the stomach around the esophagus. Uh, semi fund application, which is essentially the same thing, but instead of wrapping the stomach all the way around the esophagus, they only wrap it over a half. Then there's the streta, which is radio frequency waves that are sent to the muscles around the esophagus and the LES, causing the muscles to contract and that way strengthening those muscles. And then there's a device called endostim that essentially does the same thing or similar thing to streta, except the device is implanted similar to link surgery into your body and creates those shock waves. The endostim, I only heard about it recently. That's why it wasn't relevant at the time. If I wouldn't have dealt with this issue for 10 years, and I had a bit more money to put aside towards it and a bit more time, maybe I would try the Streta first, yes. Uh, but for me, the Lynx was definitely the right solution. And then obviously the other two surgeries, the Nissen fund application and the semi fund application, those are more invasive uh, surgeries. So to your question, why did I go with the Lynx surgery? Obviously because the Lynx surgery is just a uh, simpler procedure. It's reversible. So if anything goes wrong, you can get the magnetic ring out of your body. So it was a quicker, simpler solution. And I thought, why don't I try the simpler solution first? And then if all fails and it doesn't work, then I can always go and do a fund application. So that was my mindset behind why I chose to do the link surgery. Okay. So this is an interesting question. Did you not consider correcting the hernia first without implanting the links? to see whether or not that would fix the problem. Very good question, excellent actually. I've been suffering with this issue for too long. I already know from my short bulimic past, from IBS past, I know that my tendency as a person, if something goes bad mentally, if I'm having a bad time, it's probably going to manifest itself in my digestion. Do I wanna deal with this again in the future? Or should I fix the hernia and then just put that little ring on there just for extra help. I just didn't see anything bad in that. I just thought that was a great idea. So basically I was helping myself to not be prone to getting reflux all the time. You see what I mean? So if I fix the hernia and then down the line, I have a bad period of time. I go through stress. Uh, mentally, I'm not in the best place again. Even pregnancy would push the diaphragm up. So knowing that I have that tendency, to me, it was for my peace of mind. So no, I didn't think about fixing the hernia and then waiting to see what would happen because I just didn't think it was worth it. I thought, let's just put the links in there and enjoy my peace of mind. Okay, so this question relates to another video I uploaded about my story specifically with a surgery, about the whole process and all that. If you wanted to hear that specific story in my video, then click the banner that is showing up right now. Why did you have to take antibiotics? Did you have swallowing problems? You need to do swallowing tests because there is apparently a correlation between weak muscles in the esophagus, uh, weak LES, and then obviously reflux and silent reflux. So you, they always do the swallowing test, but also additionally to know whether you're going to be able to open and close the links. If your oh, swallowing muscles are not going to push hard enough to get the food through the ring, 
um, then the food's not going to go to your stomach. That antibiotics that I got was an antibiotics to strengthen my esophagus muscles. So no, I didn't have uh, apparent swallowing problems, but my swallowing muscles were not very strong. So yes, I did take antibiotics for six weeks. What was the name of the antibiotics that you got from the doctor? So the antibiotics is, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, it's called acetromycin or something like that, but uh, the name is down here now. And again, if you want to hear the story about why I was taking the antibiotics and who suggested it, then just click the banner that was showing before. Another tricky question, after the antibiotics, helped strengthen your swallowing muscles. Did you not consider waiting to see whether the esophagus sphincter would strengthen without having the link surgery? So to your question, no, because I was very pro link surgery. I thought it was a brilliant idea. I wanted to do the surgery. So I was already in the mindset that I'm fixing my hernia and I'm putting the Lynx ring down there to protect me in the future. Okay, so someone wrote PPIs, i.e. the acidity regulating pills can cause weakening of the LES, the lower sphincter. You should have stopped taking PPIs and then have no surgery. Okay, so I would say that that's not really a question, that's more of a statement. In my experience, the PPIs may have contributed to the LPR symptoms, to the silent reflux. But as you can see, there seems to be a line of questions or remarks that are saying, if you would have done this, you could have avoided surgery. But I think, guys, at the point that I was at, I was not trying to find reasons to avoid surgery. The surgery made sense. I was ready. I was mentally ready. I was excited to get the links. And it just clicked to me that that beaded magnetic ring is going to change my life. I saw a video by a doctor explaining how reflux is actually caused by low acidity in the stomach or low pH. And you can take acidity pills. That is the approach that I spoke about when I was trying the betaine HCL. Betaine HCL is basically just acid. You take those pills with water. And I actually decided to do that as an experiment with my partner. So I gave him one acidity pill, I took one acid pill, um, and we drank it together. He didn't get anything, and I immediately got a burn in my stomach, a burning sensation, so I did not take any more. But then I said, just for curiosity, can you take one more? It's a natural supplement, so he just took one more, and still there was nothing. So it's possible that he may have low uh, acidity in his stomach, because he wasn't affected by it at all, but I definitely did not suffer from low acidity, so it is very clear to say that doesn't apply for everyone. Is there anything you can recommend to help alleviate symptoms? Yes! So again, if you wanted to check out my other video about alleviating symptoms of LPR, if you click the banner up here, you'll find it there. However, when it comes to GERD and reflux, I don't actually have any treatment for that. And that's why I went with the surgery because I couldn't find any way of actually getting rid of the reflux. Alrighty, so we're moving on to the second part of this video, and this one relates to the surgery itself. I'm going to start with technical questions, general questions about the procedure itself. And the first one is, what exactly is the Lynx procedure? So, of course, there's plenty of information out there. I'm just going to give uh, a quick preview of what the Lynx is. The Lynx itself is a small magnetic ring of beads installed at the bottom of the esophagus above the stomach and basically closes up, seals up that area. The benefits of it versus the other treatments is that um, the magnetic beads open and close easily. So basically you can burp, you can hiccup, you can vomit if necessary. So that means when you're eating food and you're swallowing it, the action of oh, will open the ring of beads the food will come down or drink. And then if you there's pressure from the stomach, like a hiccup, a burp, or a vomit, then whatever needs to get out will get out. There are other benefits to it. It's a keyhole surgery, it's less invasive, and it is reversible in the case that there's any issues. So yeah, that's just general information about the Lynx procedure. How long does the operation take and how long is recovery? So it's also a quick surgery. I think I was in and out within two hours. Some people can already go home that night. I personally stayed overnight, but that was just because I had a bad reaction to the anesthetic and basically they kept me there for observation. But generally some people leave on the same day. And how long is recovery? So obviously when speaking of recovery, it's more individual, but the 
major part of recovery, uh, as in when do I start feeling much better and can go back to work. For me personally, I can say that the initial recovery, the major part of it was the first week. Is a hiatal hernia repair the same thing as a Nissen fund duplication operation? No, it is not the same thing because hiatal hernia repair is a restorative surgery uh, where it basically the doctor will restore the body to the original condition. Uh, a Nissen fund duplication is essentially a preventive surgery, which is wrapping a section of the stomach around the bottom of the esophagus, around the LES, the sphincter, to make sure it's strong enough to prevent reflux um, and it is not the same. How does the doctor decide whether to recommend Nissen fund application or links to a patient? Uh, and what parameters should be considered before making a decision. I don't know exactly how the doctor will decide uh, on one operation versus the other. I can only imagine it has to do with uh, the speciality of the doctor, what procedure they're experienced in. Um, I would imagine it has to do with different symptoms. So different operations will maybe be more ideal for specific symptoms. But I think when you go to a consultation, you can ask that question and you will get all the information that you need hopefully from the expert. Some GPs are reluctant to even try a referral for link surgery because they say that the surgery is too risky. What is your opinion regarding that? Okay, so because that is a newer procedure, it hasn't been around as long as the Nissen fund application. A, there's less specialists that actually perform the surgery and B, there is less years of research about it. I think there is now more than 10 years of research of link surgery. Uh, you can find somebody who will specialize in it and it depends on the country. So I guess if you go to a doctor or a GP that will not refer you for a link surgery, just do more research and find out whether it's available in your country, um, whether you can get it privately or with insurance and um, who can perform the surgery. Now, a great way to do that is via the Lynx Facebook group, which I have already recommended in another video that I've done. That's a Facebook group for Lynx surgery. Um, it accommodates for people who are considering the surgery, people who are in the procedure spectrum, and of course will accompany you on your healing journey after the surgery. I will link it down below in the description as well. So that's the Lynx Surgery Facebook group. I truly recommend it. Is the Lynx Surgery covered under the UK's NHS? Yes, it is. If you live in the UK, then you should definitely inquire about it. How much does Lynx Surgery cost? outside the national health cover. Is it covered by insurance companies or do you have to pay out of your own pocket? Again, I did not do research with uh, other insurance companies. There is a possibility that it is. This requires a bit more research on your front. And how much does the surgery cost? It costs differently in different countries and in different institutes that perform and offer that service. I know of the quote that I received from Reflux UK, which is relevant to two years ago, and that amount was 8,000. UK pounds. Do you have to go through the whole process either through the NHS or privately? Okay, so my journey was a bit of a mishmash of the two. I started with the NHS, with the GP, and then getting a referral to Reflex UK. Then I was with Reflex UK and I did the test with the team. Then they gave me a quote, basically a private cost quote, and then I realized, well, I can get the uh, procedure for free via the NHS. And so I chose to be referred back to an NHS doctor. I'm not sure why my journey went that way. Maybe it was just meant to be because that's how I got to the antibiotics um, that has helped me with my swallowing. It all happened and meant to be so that I'll be sitting here creating this video today and telling you about that because the NHS doctors did not know about the antibiotics. Is the surgery available in Canada or in Russia or in the Philippines? So I wouldn't really know whether the surgery is available in one specific country. Whichever country you're in, you probably have to just do the research in your own area. Join the Facebook group, which I just uh, recommended earlier, and ask there, does anyone know whether the surgery is available in this and this country? Um, because there are people from around the world on that Facebook group, so that's immensely helpful. I don't know exactly in which country it is or isn't offered, so sorry, I couldn't help any more than that. My doctor says that people who had the surgery still have problems down the line because some choose to remove the device later on but doctors won't tell you that. Is this true? Okay, so without going too deep into what doctors will tell you or not tell you, um, I would say that some people have the device removed, 
some people have problems afterwards. As far as I know from research and from what I've read and from what I've heard from the different doctors I've spoken to, um, the majority of patients, I'm saying vast majority, so probably over 80%, um, are super happy with their results. Um, the success rates are, I think, anywhere between 20 and 100% improvement on symptoms. My doctor personally did make me aware of complications. He also, it was very obvious that he tried not to get my hopes up too high. He was like, okay, this is the surgery. This is the good that could come out of it. This is the complications that may come out of it. But really it is a considerably safe um, option. On the overall, it is quite a simple procedure. And I know some people are struggling, but I always try to think positive and I was, I guess, lucky and did not suffer from any of the complications. Does the surgery help if you suffer from regurgitation? As far as I know, yes. I didn't have regurgitation or like I said, maybe it happened to me like once or twice, but not to the amount that it would affect my daily life. As far as I know, there are some very good results for regurgitation from the surgery. But again, join the Facebook group and that's a great place to ask all the questions that I can't really help you with because I haven't had those symptoms. Does the surgery help if you suffer from LPR or silent reflux? And how do you diagnose LPR? In my case, it has helped immensely. I would say my LPR symptoms are 99% better if I can measure it in a way. I did add a link below in the description to an article also on the website of Reflux UK as to why is LPR so difficult to diagnose. So if you want any more information about whether you have LPR and how to diagnose it and why it's difficult to diagnose, etc., etc., then please click the link in the description. And there's also the test, which I mentioned before, a quick checkup test to see whether you have the symptoms. This is a good one. How long does the esophagitis take to fully heal after surgery. So from what I read online, it can take anywhere between a few days to a few weeks for the esophagitis to heal. Again, it depends really on the severity of the inflammation, but then at the same time, I think we should be focusing not on the amount of time that the healing takes, but more on the symptoms, right? Because we're all here because of our symptoms, because of suffering from them. So if you're going through the surgery and if your symptoms are getting much better, then you know that the esophagitis is getting lowered. Otherwise you would keep getting acidic, getting refluxy. So I guess as being a non-doctor, I would know whether my esophagitis is healing based on symptoms. Can patients eat normally after surgery or do they need to change their diets? What I know in general from the doctor's advice is that you're supposed to go back to eating normally straight after surgery, unless you have complications, of course. Um, generally, you should start with smaller bites. That's the most important thing. It's not necessarily changing your nutrition, but the way you eat. So you have to eat slower, you have to chew longer, and they will hopefully explain that to you. I mean, the doctor and the supportive team. The main reason being because you need to exercise, as they call the links, the rings. So you have to be able to get used to swallowing, getting the food down through that tightened esophagus. Some people after surgery think, oh, I'm going to just have liquids and stuff because they're afraid that food will get stuck. So no, you're not supposed to change your eating. But yes, there's a learning curve of changing the eating habits, I would say, of the way you're eating. As far as food, the only thing I would say, and that's a tip, is don't start your meal with dry foods. Because again, dry foods are the ones that tend to get stuck. So they do recommend that if you're having bread or you're having cake, put a butter on it, put syrup on it, dip it in a gravy, make sure that you're eating it um, smoother. You don't wanna have hard boiled eggs straight up. You don't wanna have bread, uh, chips, potatoes, uh, rice, anything like that. Try to eat it a bit later into the meal. Okay, this is an important one. If the lynx is magnetic, which it is, can you still get an MRI? So this is why you get this card at the end of the surgery. I'm gonna bring it closer and see if you can see it. Basically it says Lynx implant card. Attention, this patient has a magnetic implant in the area of the gastroesophageal junction. The patient should not be exposed to an MRI environment greater than 1.5 Tesla. MRI scanners exceeding 1.5 Tesla could cause serious injury to the patient and or interfere with the magnetic strength and the function of the device. So yes, you can get an MRI uh, as long as it is not higher than 1.5 T. You should also show this card if you're going through a metal detector, but I have to say I've gone through several already and didn't have 
have any beeping or any issues. Will the metal ring not spoil the mucous membrane over time? Okay, so there is information online about how sometimes there could be corrosion where the metal will dissolve over time. Uh, but from what I've read, it has been very rare. If it wasn't rare, then this operation wouldn't have gained so much popularity over such a short amount of time. Um, again, in any surgery, any type of procedure, any type of new device is bound to have a success rate and a failure rate. So yeah, I guess I took that into consideration, but if you read about it, the more you read about it, the more you realize how rare it actually is. So to say that I was concerned about it, maybe in the very beginning, but I think by the time I got to the decision to go ahead with the surgery, I was not concerned with that anymore. What are the long-term concerns with the surgery? Do you know whether it can cause any problems? I know that people have had mostly functionality problems uh, with the fitting of the ring to them. Sometimes they needed a dilation where it was too tight, it wasn't opening properly, their swallowing muscles uh, were not strong enough to open. So I think functional issues come up quite a bit after surgery. Problems with eating, so just day-to-day -day function again of the ring, whether uh, pooling, which is uh, a phenomenon whereby liquid gets stuck in the esophagus and doesn't go all the way down, or food, which is the dysphagia, when food gets stuck in the esophagus and doesn't go all the way down. I know that dysphagia and pulling does go away after time. There's a bit of a learning curve with eating with the new device. I personally had it very easy, but I do know that other people do struggle, so it really depends. As far as more long-term complications down the line, yes, there are people that have the device taken out uh, for various reasons. Some people have sharp pain in their chest. Um, some people keep having heartburn for whatever a reason and it doesn't actually help them. Some people do a dilation several times and then decide to remove the device. But again, in any procedure, there is the chance of complications. There is another Facebook group that is called Link Surgery Complications Group. And that's a support group for people having complications. I'm putting the link to the Facebook group in the description below for research purposes. I wanted to read a little bit about the complications that people had. At the same time, I think it's really important to take it in perspective because if you're going to sit and read everything that people write in the complications group, it might just deter you from a pretty minimal and straightforward operation. So I will just say that while it's important to do your research, I wouldn't sit and obsess over complications just because any of them could come up and none of them can come up when it comes to you. Just because someone had that complication does not mean you're going to have it. And that's why I'm saying take it all with a pinch of salt, take it all in perspective, but do your research well enough so that you at least feel comfortable in knowing what might arise. Okay, so these are questions about the surgery, but about my personal experience. When did you get the procedure done? So I had the procedure done two years ago. Where did you get the surgery done and who was your surgeon? My surgeon was Dr. Nera and that was at Epsom General Hospital in Epsom, United Kingdom. Ooh, this is an interesting question literally from a few weeks ago. Was your surgery laparoscopic or robotic? And when I read that, I was like, oh, I wish I had a robotic. So no, my surgery was laparoscopic, which is really boring, which is five little incisions, keyhole incisions. But apparently in some countries, the surgery is available as a robotic surgery. Basically it's the same keyhole surgery, but the surgeon is actually sitting on the other side of the room and just wiggling with joysticks that are moving the robotic arms from afar and fiddling inside your tummy, doing everything that's necessary. A little bit creepy and very fifth element, but I love it. Unfortunately, the answer is no. Mine was laparoscopic. Mm, boring. How long does the whole process take from getting a referral to actually getting the surgery done? Okay, so I just went through my emails to double check and I started the inquiry regarding the link surgery in January of 2018 and I had my actual surgery on February of 2019. So just over a year. What tests did you have to do before the surgery? I actually wrote a list down to make sure I don't forget any of them. So I've had two endoscopies because the first one was inconclusive and then someone asked to do it again. Endoscopy is the test whereby they uh, insert a tube through your mouth, it goes in with a little camera and then they look into your esophagus and just look at the action down there, whether the sphincter is working or not, whether the, there's esophagitis, whether there's a hernia. Then I had one Bravo pH test. That's where they insert a 
device into your esophagus and that stays there for 24 hours and it's just monitoring the changes in acidity. Then I had the esophageal manometry. That's the swallowing test. It's, I think it's called barium swallowing test. Um, that is where you go to a, a lab and they let you drink something through a straw. Very slowly you have to go ooh, 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 and do the swallowing sounds. And then on a computer screen they check how well you're swallowing, what is the pressure during the swallow, and based on that they know um, whether there's any issue with the functionality of your esophagus muscles, because that's those are the muscles that push the food down, and at the end of the day, also uh, make sure that you can open and close the lynx ring. I do know from people that sometimes they take the tests and they come back inconclusive, which can be really frustrating. The surgeon was not able to tell whether I actually had acid reflux. Obviously, I am aware that I've got it and I'm suffering. But then before I did the second endoscopy, um, what I did is the night before, I just heightened my symptoms. So I ate a lot of triggering foods. I drank red wine, I ate some dark chocolate and had a coffee. Then I went to sleep and of course in the morning, lo and behold, when I had my endoscopy, they found esophagitis because it was inflamed. The same thing goes to the Bravo pH testing. So when they insert the device into your esophagus that's going to stay there and measure the acidity, you do want to eat normally what other people would eat. So food that you might avoid. So have some spicy food and drink some orange juice and drink coffee in the morning because that way it can really monitor your levels of acidity if you're just behaving like a normal person. Do you remember what size of Lynx ring device was used for yourself? And also did the doctor use your actual esophagus size or did he go a size up? When the doctor has showed me the Lynx, it was literally the size of my wedding ring. It was like just a normal ring size. So it would be this with obviously the beads around it, which are a little bit thicker. I think if you got a specialist surgeon, they would know exactly how to fit the device size to you. So I wouldn't worry about it too much because they're supposed to know what they're doing. Did you feel anything during the surgery? No, I was under full anesthesia. I didn't respond to the anesthetic very well and I woke up in a mess. But apart from that, the surgery was really easy going. Do you feel the magnetic ring in your body after the surgery? So funny enough, this was exactly the question that I was concerned about um, before I did the surgery. I was thinking, Mm, do I feel it in my body? Like, does it feel differently when I swallow? Is it going to be weird when I'm eating? The answer is no to all of those. No, 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 no. You don't feel anything. You just eat normally. And isn't that what we all want to feel normal again? All right. This is very exciting. We're in the last part of this video and these are the post-op questions. So general questions about my journey and other people's journey about how they feel after the surgery. So Let's go ahead. How do you feel now? I feel amazing. This is why I do this video because I think you should get the surgery. It's life changing and it's been great to me. So do you have any reflux or any side effects? No and no. What PPIs, um, acidity regulators, did you need to take after surgery? None whatsoever. I do think that some other people, um, depending on symptom severity, uh, you may have your surgeon tell you, okay, keep taking PPIs, but just lower the dosage gradually. But my surgeon just said, just get off them immediately after surgery and see how you get on. Did you have to take any medicine or antibiotics after the surgery? I personally didn't. I think you shouldn't need to. But then again, I can't speak for everyone and people that have complications may need to take other medicines. How long after surgery did you have the shoulder pain? Okay, so the famous shoulder pain of the lynx. What does that mean? So during the surgery, you're being pumped up with air around the chest area so the doctor can do the laparoscopic surgery easily and maneuver between the uh, internal organs. So when you're being pumped up with air in your chest, it causes this weird pressure and it pressures here, the lungs. So I personally had the shoulder pain on the right side for about two days. Then it started migrating onto the left side. It was a little bit strange, then stayed there for, I think, another day. So I think altogether was about three days. I was dying to sit in a bath, but you don't really want to sit in a bath because of the incisions. But if you cover them properly, you can do a warm shower, um, not on the first or second day I think you can shower from the third day you try to stretch it as far as you can I just remember that it was difficult to breathe because you complete the breath using your lungs then the lung is pumped up with air it's pressuring the shoulder it's not a pleasant feeling there's a beautiful healing meditation that I've put 
below in the description. Even if you're not regularly meditating, try it. It's in the link below and I hope that it will help you. Can you breathe normally again after having the surgery? Yes, after those first two days that it was a bit difficult with the shoulder, I would say breathing was much more normalized. I think this question may relate to people who have trouble breathing because of silent reflux. So if you have LPR, yes, after the surgery, I didn't feel this um, weirdness of not being able to breathe properly from LPR. I didn't have that anymore. So if the question relates to that, Either way, the breathing is completely normal. Do you feel any chest, stomach, or esophagus discomfort after surgery? No, no, and no. Can you belch, hiccup, and vomit normally after links? Yes, and I think that's one of the advantages of Lynx, and that's part of the reason I was really attracted to it, because I thought, oh, I don't want any situation where I can't burp if I need to, or feel pressure, or can't vomit, or... So this was really appealing to me, seems to be working absolutely fine. Do you suffer from any gas or bloating? Nope. But for the first six months after surgery, yes, I was experiencing some IBS, uh, but then I went to my naturopath and I got some treatment for it. Um, so maybe sometimes food supplements, sometimes going to a nutritionist can really help with that. And sometimes it's residue of gases and whatever not that they put into your body after surgery. There's lots of great holistic treatments out there. And a lot of times uh, gas and bloatiness is not something that you can take pills for. Sometimes it requires some relaxation of stress, especially after a procedure like a surgery you want to do meditation or you want to go to therapist or you want to talk about mentally what you're going through and all those things will calm your gut for sure. Try to mix different combinations of therapies if one thing doesn't work. Do you suffer any dysphagia after links? And what about now? Dysphagia, uh, to clarify, is when you try to eat and food gets stuck in your esophagus. So as I mentioned before, the biggest tip I can give if you go through the surgery is to change the way you eat. Practice before the surgery. Start eating a bit slower and chewing a lot more. I actually have a video with great tip about how to teach yourself to chew slower because it's something that I taught myself how to do. So I'm going to put that up here now in the banner if you can see what about now no i don't have any dysphagia anymore and even after the surgery i think i only suffered from food getting stuck 10 times which is not much 10 times in all those months how does it feel to get dysphagia that's a bit stressy right if you've never had that happen to you you don't know what that's gonna feel like and that's a little bit stressful it feels a bit almost like maybe i can't breathe because when you go you feel a food get stuck but again it's an illusion because it doesn't get stuck in your breathing tunnel obviously but it's a very uncomfortable feeling in this area in the esophagus the most important thing again is just chewing slowly and if it happens don't panic so just drink lots of water water will enable whatever is stuck in your throat to just go down it's just a bit of a work in progress don't eat big bites and don't start the meal with really dry foods. Is that a reason not to have surgery? No. Did you have any pooling after the surgery? Okay, so pooling is again, when liquid that is soft is not exercising as in opening and closing the ring uh, of the links strongly enough and then it gets stuck in your esophagus. I know it's something that happens to people. I personally did not have pooling. I just had the dysphagia and like I said, not very many times. You can ask those questions in the Facebook group that I referred you to. I wouldn't imagine it to be too different than dysphagia. So it is probably just very unpleasant. Um, and that's not a reason not to do the surgery. It's just one of those complications or trickiness that you have to get through after doing the surgery. Do your research, ask your questions about it, and um, hopefully it never happens to you. Did you have any weight loss after surgery, either because of having to eat slower or eating less? or because you had any pain. So I didn't have any pain after surgery, um, apart from what I mentioned, the shoulder pain and slight pain in the incisions, which went away quite quickly. I probably lost a little bit of weight because you have surgery and then you kind of lose your appetite a bit, then you eat smaller chunks or slower, but I went straight back to normal after that, so I didn't really notice anything specific. Did the surgery help your LPR? How are your symptoms now? Most doctors are gonna tell you the link surgery is not meant to cure LPR, but I have to say that I have had 90 something percent uh, improvement. My way of thinking was, okay, even if it's not gonna cure it 100%, I'm gonna do the surgery anyways because it's gonna cure my heartburn. And if it cures the LPR even a tiny bit, it was still worth 
doing it, if you see what I mean. So that's the sense that I made of it, I guess. Um, and I thought, you know, if it blocks that area and I fix my hiatal hernia, hopefully I will have less LPR, less bad breath, you know, less dryness. It's only those really triggering foods in a massive combination that would cause a little bit more of the LPR symptoms. So if you ask, did it help the symptoms? Of course. Would you do it all over again? I would do it in a heartbeat. How are your symptoms now? Mild to non-existent. Okay, we're going to finish with some daily functionality questions. Um, how are you currently dealing with food? What is your current menu? Uh, can you eat everything you want? Sodas and spicy food. So the answer is everything's fine. Yes, I eat whatever I want. My eating is normal. My menu is whatever I feel like eating. It's a life-changing operation, as I've mentioned before. I recommend it to everyone. This is why I keep making videos about it. Do you have any restrictions now? Do you still have to take smaller bites or eat slower than normal? No, no, and no. But I eat slowly anyways, just because it's healthy. It says you have to eat hard food every few hours to exercise opening and closing the links ring. Did you do it? And if so, what did you eat to exercise it? I, to be honest, was really laid back about my recovery. I ate normal. I got the concept. The concept was don't start eating baby food because that's not going to help you go back to normality. Even taking food supplements after the surgery to help the healing and I didn't have a problem just going, Ooh, you know, <laughs> practicing the links by swallowing pills. I was just focusing on I understand that I need to go back to normal eating. I'm going to try and slowly move myself in the direction of eating normally as quickly as I can and as quickly as it felt right for my body. Do you have to sleep upright or can you sleep flat on a normal pillow now? After surgery, the reflux symptoms went away straight away. The silent reflux, the LPR, uh, it took a little bit longer for them to heal and I've noticed that it was going slower. And the LPR symptoms tend to be more prominent at nighttime when you lie down and then that acidic gas comes up. For a while I did sleep on an elevated pillow, um, but I don't have to do that anymore and I'm two years out. So I would assume that hopefully if you go through the surgery and symptoms start getting better, then you will be able to not sleep elevated anymore. Uh, with regards to actual acid reflux or heartburn, you shouldn't need to be elevated. Um, it should really do the trick straight away. So this is a question about fitness after surgery. Now that you have the device implanted, does it affect your fitness level? Are you able to run on a treadmill? Are you able to use the elliptical? And can you lift weights? So when it comes to keeping fit, it's important to do that after surgery, but you have to do it gradually. If you are an athlete or you're like serious at the gym, uh, I would recommend to consult with your doctor. They will tell you how long you need to wait. Usually they say at least six weeks without lifting anything heavy in general, just resting. I think what I did was about four weeks in, I did try to plank and it just didn't feel right. So I think I did it for about a minute and I was like, okay, no, I'm not gonna plank anymore. So I stopped and it just didn't feel right. So go with what feels right, go with what the doctor says, listen to your body, be patient with the healing process. I think the worst thing that you can do is go through something like this and then push your body to an unnecessary limit. So um, when it comes to, can I do anything now? Yes, I'm two years out. I think I was already doing normal fitness a few months after the surgery. I don't remember exactly, but I went gradually back into fitness. Okay, this is a question for you if you're a vocalist, if you're a voiceover artist, if you're an actor, if you're a public speaker, if you work with your voice and you're suffering with vocal cords issues related to LPR, um, can you sing normally now? Yes, I can. I mean, without having to stop eating three hours before a performance. Yes, okay, so performing, that was a major issue for me because I perform weekly. It was always a ceremony before a performance. Uh, should I eat this? Should I not eat that? Can I eat this? Can I not eat that? Is this gonna make me hoarse? Is this gonna make my vocal cords dry? Is it gonna make my mouth dry? Is this gonna dry my lips? Is it gonna make my saliva sticky? Is it gonna block my sinuses? And the list goes on. So with LPR, to me, it's normalized. Like I mentioned, it took a little bit longer than just the reflux, the heartburn. I'm probably not going to go on an acid fest, okay? So I'm not going to go and have coffee with a shot of brandy before the gig. But then I'm not changing anything else in my eating. If you're going to perform or you're going to use your, your voice, just eat something calming, you know, don't trigger it. That would be my tip. Just there's no point in triggering it. So why even doing it? Am I eating normally now and don't have to think, oh, if I'm going to eat this curry, will I be able to perform or not? Yes, I can do whatever I want. I can eat whatever I want. And even if I drink coffee, I'm fine to record afterwards. Um, 
I don't worry about it too much anymore. I had the Lynx procedure a week ago and I'm getting a burning in the back of the throat daily. Did you experience this? So I would say no. It sounds like you should consult with your doctor with any complications, you probably should. But again, in this case, I really recommend the Facebook groups, whether you're looking for information before the surgery or you are experiencing difficulty after the surgery, whether you're having anxiety or complications or just general questions, ask the questions. Um, you're gonna be answered really quickly and get a lot of support. So they've been wonderful. Check out the links in the description to both Facebook groups. I think this is probably my favorite question and a good one to finish with. If you could go back in time, would you do the surgery or not? Yes, yes, yes. I would do the surgery over again tomorrow morning if you said that I had to. Like I said in the beginning of this video, I had 10 years to explore different options on how I'm gonna heal myself. And I was working on healing myself physically, mentally and emotionally on all kinds of levels. And I think all of that and a good mindset, positive mindset into healing into the next stage of my life has sort of culminated in the decision to make the surgery. It wasn't like I woke up in the morning with heartburn and decided to do a surgery. Do your research ask your questions, be a member of the Facebook groups, um, prepare yourself on all possible levels, mental, emotional, physical. If there are other underlying conditions, if you have other surgeries that you've done and you're worried, oh, is this one gonna do the trick? And you don't wanna keep having more and more procedures, look into holistic therapy, look into alternative medicine, look at what other options are there. And when you feel like you've exhausted everything, when you feel like you're in the right mindset to get healthy, if you are going under the knife, come prepared, come with a good attitude, come with a positive outlook and just think about healing and focus on that. Don't focus on complications. Don't focus on everybody else's problems and don't imagine how it manifests into you having those problems because I just don't see that as a very good outlook. So there's no simple way to prepare yourself for a surgery. It's always a heavy decision. Um, if you have any other questions, I'm more than happy to try and answer. Please put them in the comments below. If you know any other people who suffer with heartburn reflux and wanna ask questions about it and are considering the surgery or maybe interested in it, send them this video. And hopefully we're gonna be able to help a lot more people now and in the future. Thank you so much for joining me on this long Q&A. Thank you for your listening and for your patience. I'm Lilac and if you have any other questions you want to ask, I'm here to try and help. In the meantime, feel free to join our community and subscribe to the channel. I try to upload interesting subjects about mindfulness, about self-awareness, about healing and self-healing, meditation, uh, and some music. So uh, join us and I'll see you soon on the next video. Bye-bye.